Section 57 of The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett Section 57 to sir watkin phillips baronet of jesus college oxford dear phillips if i stay much longer at edinburgh i shall be changed into a downright caledonian my uncle observes that i have already acquired something of the country accent the people here are so social and attentive in their civilities to strangers that i am insensibly sucked into the channel of their manners and customs although they are in fact much more different from ours than you can imagine that difference however which struck me very much at my first arrival i now hardly perceive and my ear is perfectly reconciled to the scotch accent which i find even agreeable in the mouth of a pretty woman it is a sort of doric dialect which gives an idea of amiable simplicity you cannot imagine how we have been caressed and feasted in the good town of edinburgh of which we are become free denizens and guild brothers by the special favour of the magistracy i had a whimsical commission from bath to a citizen of this metropolis quinn understanding our intention to visit edinburgh pulled out a guinea and desired the favour i would drink it at a tavern with a particular friend and bottle companion of his mr r c a lawyer of this city i charged myself with the commission and taking the guinea you see said i i have pocketed your bounty yes replied quinn laughing and a headache into the bargain if you drink fair i made use of this introduction to mr c who received me with open arms and gave me the rendezvous according to the cartel he had provided a company of jolly fellows among whom i found myself extremely happy and did mr c and quinn all the justice in my power but alas i was no more than a tyro among a troop of veterans who had compassion upon my youth and conveyed me home in the morning by what means i know not quinn was mistaken however as to the headache the claret was too good to treat me so roughly while mr bramble holds conferences with the graver literati of the place and our females are entertained at visits by the scotch ladies who are the best and kindest creatures upon earth i pass my time among the bucks of edinburgh who with a great share of spirit and vivacity have a certain shrewdness and self-command that is not often found among their neighbours in the high day of youth and exultation not a hint escapes a scotchman that can be interpreted into offence by any individual in the company and national reflections are never heard in this particular i must own we are both unjust and ungrateful to the scots for as far as i am able to judge they have a real esteem for the natives of south britain and never mention our country but with expressions of regard nevertheless they are far from being servile imitators of our modes and fashionable vices all their customs and regulations of public and private economy of business and diversion are in their own style this remarkably predominates in their looks their dress and manner their music and even their cookery our squire declares that he knows not another people upon earth so strongly marked with a national character now we are upon the article of cookery i must own some of their dishes are savoury and even delicate but i am not yet scotchman enough to relish their singed sheep's head and haggis 
which were provided at our request one day at Mr. Mitchelson's, where we dined. The first put me in mind of the history of Congo, in which I had read of negroes' heads sold publicly in the markets. The last, being a mess of minced lights, livers, suet, oatmeal, onions, and pepper, enclosed in a sheep's stomach, had a very sudden effect upon mine, and the delicate Mistress Tabby changed colour, when the cause of our disgust was instantaneously removed at the nod of our entertainer. The Scots in general are attached to this composition, with a sort of national fondness, as well as to their oatmeal bread, which is presented at every table in thin triangular cakes, baked upon a plate of iron called a girdle, and these many of the natives, even in the higher ranks of life, prefer to wheaten bread, which they have here in perfection. You know we used to vex poor Murray of Balliol College by asking if there was really no fruit but turnips in Scotland. Sure enough, I have seen turnips make their appearance, not as a dessert, but by way of hors d'oeuvre, or whets, as radishes are served betwixt more substantial dishes in France and Italy. But it must be observed that the turnips of this country are as much superior in sweetness, delicacy, and flavour to those in England, as a musk melon is to the stock of a common cabbage. They are small and conical, of a yellowish colour, with a very thin skin, and over and above their agreeable taste, are valuable for their antiscorbutic quality. As to the fruit now in season, such as cherries, gooseberries, and currants, there is no want of them at Edinburgh, and in the gardens of some gentlemen who live in the neighbourhood there is now a very favourable appearance of apricots, peaches, nectarines, and even grapes. Nay, I have seen a very fine show of pineapples within a few miles of this metropolis. Indeed, we have no reason to be surprised at these particulars, when we consider how little difference there is, in fact, betwixt this climate and that of London. All the remarkable places in the city and its avenues, for ten miles around we have visited, much to our satisfaction. In the castle are some royal apartments, where the sovereign occasionally resided, and here are carefully preserved the regalia of the kingdom, consisting of a crown said to be of great value, a sceptre and a sword of state adorned with jewels. Of these symbols of sovereignty the people are exceedingly jealous. A report being spread during the sitting of the Union Parliament that they were removed to London, such a tumult arose that the Lord Commissioner would have been torn to pieces if he had not produced them for the satisfaction of the populace. The palace of Holyrood House is an elegant piece of architecture, but sunk in an obscure and, as I take it, unwholesome bottom where one would imagine it had been placed on purpose to be concealed. The apartments are lofty but unfurnished, and as for the pictures of the Scottish kings, from Fergus I to King William, they are paltry daubings, mostly by the same hand, painted either from the imagination or porters hired to sit for the purpose. All the diversions of London we enjoy at Edinburgh, in a small compass. Here is a well-conducted concert, in which several gentlemen perform on different instruments. The Scots are all musicians. Every man you meet plays on the flute, the violin or violoncello, and there is one nobleman whose compositions are universally admired. Our company of actors is very tolerable, and a subscription is now on foot for building a new theatre, but their assemblies please me above all other public exhibitions. We have been at the Hunter's Ball, where I was really astonished to see such a number of fine women. 
the english who have never crossed the tweed imagine erroneously that the scotch ladies are not remarkable for personal attractions but i can declare with a safe conscience i never saw so many handsome females together as were assembled on this occasion at the leith races the best company comes hither from the remoter provinces so that i suppose we had all the beauty of the kingdom concentrated as it were into one focus which was indeed so vehement that my heart could hardly resist its power between friends it has sustained some damage from the bright eyes of the charming miss renton whom i had the honour to dance with at the ball the countess of melville attracted all eyes and the admiration of all present she was accompanied by the agreeable miss greve who made many conquests nor did my sister liddy pass unnoticed in the assembly she has become a toast at edinburgh by the name of the fair cambrian and has already been the occasion of much wine shed but the poor girl met with an accident at the ball which has given us great disturbance a young gentleman the express image of that rascal wilson went up to ask her to dance a minuet and his sudden appearance shocked her so much that she fainted away i call wilson a rascal because if he had been really a gentleman with honourable intentions he would have ere now appeared in his own character i must own my blood boils with indignation when i think of that fellow's presumption and heaven confound me if i don't but i won't be so womanish as to rail time will perhaps furnish occasion thank god the cause of liddy's disorder remains a secret the lady directress of the ball thinking she was overcome by the heat of the place had her conveyed to another room where she soon recovered so well as to return and join in the country dances in which the scotch lasses acquit themselves with such spirit and agility as put their partners to the height of their mettle i believe our aunt mistress tabitha had entertained hopes of being able to do some execution among the cavaliers at this assembly she had been several days in consultation with milliners and mantua makers preparing for the occasion at which she made her appearance in a full suit of damask so thick and heavy that the sight of it alone at this season of the year was sufficient to draw drops of sweat from any man of ordinary imagination she danced one minuet with our friend mr mitchelson who favoured her so far in the spirit of hospitality and politeness and she was called out a second time by the young laird of ballymore hopel who coming in by accident could not readily find any other partner but as the first was a married man and the second paid no particular homage to her charms which were also overlooked by the rest of the company she became dissatisfied and censorious at supper she observed that the scotch gentlemen made a very good figure when they were a little improved by travelling and therefore it was pity they did not all take the benefit of going abroad she said the women were awkward masculine creatures that in dancing they lifted their legs like so many colts that they had no idea of graceful motion and put on their clothes in a frightful manner but if the truth must be told tabby herself was the most ridiculous figure and the worst dressed of the whole assembly the neglect of the male sex rendered her malcontent and peevish she now found fault with everything at edinburgh and teased her brother to leave the place when she was suddenly reconciled to it on a religious consideration there is a sect of fanatics who have separated themselves from the established kirk under the name of seceders they acknowledge no earthly head of the church reject lay patronage 
and maintain the methodist doctrines of the new birth the new light the efficacy of grace the insufficiency of works and the operations of the spirit mistress tabitha attended by humphrey clinker was introduced to one of their conventicles where they both received much edification and she has had the good fortune to come acquainted with a pious christian called mr moffat who is very powerful in prayer and often assists her in private exercises of devotion i never saw such a concourse of genteel company at any races in england as appeared on the course of leith hard by in the fields called the links the citizens of edinburgh divert themselves at a game called gof in which they use a curious kind of bats tipped with horn and small elastic balls of leather stuffed with feathers rather less than tennis balls but of a much harder consistence this they strike with such force and dexterity from one hole to another that they will fly to an incredible distance of this diversion the scots are so fond that when the weather will permit you may see a multitude of all ranks from the senator of justice to the lowest tradesman mingled together in their shirts and following the balls with the utmost eagerness among others i was shown one particular set of gophers the youngest of whom was turned of fourscore they were all gentlemen of independent fortunes who had amused themselves with this pastime for the best part of a century without ever having felt the least alarm from sickness or disgust and they never went to bed without having each the best part of a gallon of claret in his belly such uninterrupted exercise cooperating with the keen air from the sea must without all doubt keep the appetite always on edge and steel the constitution against all the common attacks of distemper the leith races gave occasion to another entertainment of a very singular nature there is at edinburgh a society or corporation of errand boys called coddies who ply in the streets at night with paper lanterns and are very serviceable in carrying messages these fellows though shabby in their appearance and rudely familiar in their address are wonderfully acute and so noted for fidelity that there is no instance of a coddy's having betrayed his trust such is their intelligence that they know not only every individual of the place but also every stranger by that time he has been four and twenty hours in edinburgh and no transaction even the most private can escape their notice they are particularly famous for their dexterity in executing one of the functions of mercury though for my own part i never employed them in this department of business had i occasion for any service of this nature my own man archie mcalpin is as well qualified as e'er a coddy in edinburgh and i am much mistaken if he has not been heretofore of their fraternity be that as it may they resolved to give a dinner and a ball at leith to which they formerly invited all the young noblemen and gentlemen that were at the races and this invitation was reinforced by an assurance that all the celebrated ladies of pleasure would grace the entertainment with their company i received a card on this occasion and went thither with half a dozen of my acquaintance in a large hall the cloth was laid on a long range of tables joined together and here the company seated themselves to the number of about four score lords and lairds and other gentlemen courtesans and coddies mingled together as the slaves and their masters were in the time of the saturnalia in ancient rome the toastmaster who sat at the upper end was one coddy fraser a veteran pimp distinguished for his humour and sagacity 
well known and much respected in his profession by all the guests male and female that were here assembled he had bespoke the dinner and the wine he had taken care that all his brethren should appear in decent apparel and clean linen and he himself wore a periwig with three tails in honour of the festival i assure you the banquet was both elegant and plentiful and seasoned with a thousand sallies that promoted a general spirit of mirth and good humour after the dessert mr fraser proposed the following toasts which i don't pretend to explain the best in christendom gebs's contract the beggar's benison king and kirk great britain and ireland then filling a bumper and turning to me mr malford said he may our unkindness cease betwixt john bull and his sister moggy the next person he singled out was a nobleman who had been long abroad my lord cried fraser here is a bumper to all those noblemen who have virtue enough to spend their rents in their ain country he afterwards addressed himself to a member of parliament in these words mister i'm sure you'll ha nae objection to my drinking disgrace and duel to elk a scot that sells his conscience and his vote he discharged a third sarcasm at a person very gaily dressed who had risen from small beginnings and made a considerable fortune at play filling his glass and calling him by name lang life said he to the wily loon that gangs afield with a toom pook at his lunzy and comes hame with a sackful of siller all these toasts being received with loud bursts of applause mr fraser called for pint glasses and filled his own to the brim then standing up and all his brethren following his example my lords and gentlemen cried he here is a cup of thanks for the great and undeserved honour you have done your poor errand boys this day so saying he and they drank off their glasses in a trice and quitting their seats took their station each behind one of the other guests exclaiming no we're your honour's codies again the nobleman who had bore the first brunt of mr fraser's satire objected to his abdication he said as the company was assembled by invitation from the codies he expected they were to be entertained at their expense by no means my lord cried fraser i wouldna be guilty of such presumption for the wide world i never affronted a gentleman since i was born and sure at this age i wanna offer an indignity to such an honourable convention well said his lordship as you have expended some wit you have a right to save your money you have given me good counsel and i take it in good part as you have voluntarily quitted your seat i will take your place with the leave of the good company and think myself happy to be hailed father of the feast he was forthwith elected into the chair and complimented in a bumper in his new character the claret continued to circulate without interruption till the glasses seemed to dance upon the table and this perhaps was a hint to the ladies to call for music at eight in the evening the ball began in another apartment at midnight we went to supper but it was broad day before i found the way to my lodgings and no doubt his lordship had a swinging bill to discharge in short i have lived so riotously for some weeks that my uncle begins to be alarmed on the score of my constitution and very seriously observed that all his own infirmities are owing to such excesses indulged in his youth mistress tabitha says it would be more to the advantage of my soul as well as my body 
if instead of frequenting these scenes of debauchery i would accompany mr moffat and her to hear a sermon of the reverend mr mccorkendale clinker often exhorts me with a groan to take care of my precious health and even archie mcalpin when he happens to be overtaken which is oftener the case than i could wish reads me a long lecture upon temperance and sobriety and is so very wise and sententious that if i could provide him with a professor's chair i would willingly give up the benefit of his admonitions and service together for i was tutor sick at alma mater i am not however so much engrossed by the gaieties of edinburgh but that i find time to make parties in the family way we have not only seen all the villas and villages within ten miles of the capital but we have also crossed the firth which is an arm of the sea seven miles broad that divides lothian from the shire or as the scots call it the kingdom of fife there is a number of large open sea-boats that ply on this passage from leith to kinghorn which is a borough on the other side in one of these our whole family embarked three days ago excepting my sister who being exceedingly fearful of the water was left to the care of mrs mitchelson we had an easy and quick passage into fife where we visited a number of poor towns on the seaside including st andrews which is the skeleton of a venerable city but we were much better pleased with some noble and elegant seats and castles of which there is a great number in that part of scotland yesterday we took boat again on our return to leith with fair wind and agreeable weather but we had not advanced half way when the sky was suddenly overcast and the wind changing blew directly in our teeth so that we were obliged to turn or tack the rest of the way in a word the gale increased to a storm of wind and rain attended with such a fog that we could not see the town of leith to which we were bound nor even the castle of edinburgh notwithstanding its high situation it is not to be doubted but that we were all alarmed on this occasion and at the same time most of the passengers were seized with a nausea that produced violent retchings my aunt desired her brother to order the boatman to put back to kinghorn and this expedient he actually proposed but they assured him there was no danger mistress tabitha finding them obstinate began to scold and insisted upon my uncle's exerting his authority as a justice of the peace sick and peevish as he was he could not help laughing at this wise proposal telling her that his commission did not extend so far and if it did he should let the people take their own way for he thought it would be great presumption in him to direct them in the exercise of their own profession mistress winifred jenkins made a general clearance with the assistance of mr humphrey clinker who joined her both in prayer and ejaculation as he took it for granted that we should not be long in this world he offered some spiritual consolation to mistress tabitha who rejected it with great disgust bidding him keep his sermons for those who had leisure to hear such nonsense my uncle sat collected in himself without speaking my man archie had recourse to a brandy bottle with which he made so free that i imagine he had sworn to die of drinking anything rather than sea-water but the brandy had no more effect upon him in the way of intoxication than if it had been sea-water in good earnest as for myself I was too much engrossed by the sickness at my stomach to think of anything else. Meanwhile the sea swelled mountains high, the boat pitched with such violence as if it had been going to pieces, the cordage rattled, the wind roared, the lightning flashed, 
the thunder bellowed and the rain descended in a deluge every time the vessel was put about we shipped a sea that drenched us all to the skin when by dint of turning we thought to have cleared the pier head we were driven to leeward and then the boatmen themselves began to fear that the tide would fail before we should fetch up our leeway the next trip however brought us into smooth water and we were safely landed on the quay about one o'clock in the afternoon to be sure cried tabby when she found herself on terra firma we must all have perished if we had not been the particular care of providence yes replied my uncle but i am much of the honest highlander's mind after he had made such a passage as this his friend told him he was much indebted to providence certainly said donald but by my soul man i s ne'er trouble providence again so long as the brig of stirling stands you must know the brig or bridge of stirling stands above twenty miles up the river forth of which this is the outlet i don't find that our squire has suffered in his health from this adventure but poor liddy is in a peaking way i'm afraid this unfortunate girl is uneasy in her mind and this apprehension distracts me for she is really an amiable creature we shall set out to-morrow or next day for stirling and glasgow and we propose to penetrate a little way into the highlands before we turn our course to the southward in the meantime commend me to all our friends round carfax and believe me to be ever yours j melford edinburgh august eighth end of chapter fifty seven